some metal atom that was going to make a um, that was attractive to a bunch of things with negative charges, they can kind of arrange themselves in a shape where you get a bunch of these these X's, these just sort of placeholder atoms in all around it, kind of like this metal is a cube with six spaces. It's got a top, a bottom, a front, a back, and a left, and a right. So you can have six things coming out of this. So these, these bonds, we're going to work with this more later today. But basically, these wedges mean that um, that's a bond that's sticking out of the board towards you. And these dashed lines are sticking into the board away from you. And so if you have a shape like this as six things around it, if you actually just sort of zoom out instead of considering what the bonds look like and what's in the middle, if you just look at what these shapes are, you effectively have like a square in the middle sticking into the board and out of the board with, a, with something sticking out the top of the square and something sticking out the bottom of the square. So basically you get a four-sided pyramid that, that is sort of um, reflected around itself. So if I draw... I draw what that would look like just drawing it from the outside. You'd have something that looks like a square that's flat and sticking into the board and out of the board, making a pyramid uh, upward and then a pyramid downward too. See how that's a square pyramid on top and then a square pyramid on bottom? Count how many sides that shape has. Eight sides, right? So for my Dungeons and Dragons fans in here, that's a D8. It's an eight-sided die, it looks like that. Um, and so it's called, that shape is an octahedron. So we call this geometry an octahedral geometry, even though there's only six things attached to that middle atom. So we're going to spend some time with those shapes and visualizing them in 3D and, and see what it looks like. Um, and so learn how to predict which molecules are going to have which uh, shapes is going to be the last topic that we're going to cover and then how to leave them. Um, but for starters, random questions that were, I would normally skip over a bunch of these, but a lot of them were really tightly linked. Linked to each other, so I want to talk about them. And 
y'all are asking good questions, which means I want to spend time answering them because they're relevant to the stuff we're covering and also to some some other terms that you may have heard um, in, in everyday life. Um, so for starters, what's dark matter? Dark matter, anytime you see the word dark in sciences, it basically just means that we have evidence that it's there, but we can't see it. So for instance, dark energy is the energy that keeps all different galaxies expanding away from each other and expanding at an accelerating rate from each other. So not only is the universe expanding, it's expanding faster and faster, which is not accounted for that. The force, the energy to cause that to happen is not accounted for in our understanding of the universe yet. So we call that dark energy. Um, dark matter is really similar. It's basically, we can look at the shape of different galaxies, like the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy, some of the other close galaxies, I mean, relatively speaking to us. And we can see that based on the, on how quickly, quickly they rotate and the shape and how many stars we can see in them, we can predict um, that they must have a lot of mass in them that we can't see visibly. And not even just in the visible spectrum, but using any form of light, we can't observe this mass. And we know it must be there because we know Newton's laws of gravitation work. So if Newton's laws of gravitation work, we can predict what the total mass of the galaxy is, but the gap mass of each galaxy is more than what we can actually measure as far as you know, corroborating with other sources. So that difference between the, the amount of mass we can see and the amount of mass that we know must be there is called dark matter. Um, and so it's just basically, we're pretty sure it's there, we just don't know what form it's in. Maybe there are some of the stars that we're looking at visibly are an order of magnitude greater in size than we think they are. Maybe there's something else happening with, at these distant stars that we don't know about yet that kind of explains that. Um, and so likely those terms dark matter and dark energy will go away eventually as we get more and more understanding of the universe. Um, and somebody asked about radio, what's going on with radioactive elements at the quantum level. Um, and then a bunch of people were starting to ask about synthetic elements, man-made elements, and how that all works. So these are all kind of tied together, these questions. Um, and so to, to explain, I'm not going to fully explain what's happening at the quantum level with radioactive elements, um, but I'll, I'm going to open up this. This is a really good article, especially for those of you who are into physics. Let's do that. There we go. Um, that is what's called the standard model is basically our best understanding for how matter and the four fundamental forces sort of interact with each other in the universe. Um, and it can be explained in terms of uh, what are known as um, fermions and bosons. And so it kind of looks like a periodic table. This isn't the best way of, of understanding it. Um, but basically, everything on the left-hand side, these are the different types of matter that we may have. And everything on this side are what are known as bosons. And those are the, the different ways that matter can interact with other matter. So um, like the Z boson and W boson are part of what's known as the weak nuclear force that causes radioactive reactions to happen. When the weak nuclear force gets stronger than the strong nuclear force, nuclei fly apart and break up into pieces. And gluons are the particle that actually hold nuclei together, creatively named. Um, the gluons literally are what hold nuclei together. They're the carrier for the strong nuclear force. And photons are the carrier, the carrier particle that doesn't really have any mass for the electromagnetic force. And then this Higgs boson is sort of how, how matter interacts with space time. So it kind of, it sort of explains gravity and how gravity ties into these forces as well. So all of this is way beyond my area of expertise, way beyond anything we would probably see in physics um, at, uh, at LTCC. You might get into a little bit of the different types of matter and different types of quarks and things like that. Um, but basically what's happening in the nucleus when something breaks down is some of these interactions that happen 
cause it to be more stable if it flies apart than to stay together. And things naturally, the way that the universe behaves is everything naturally moves towards its most stable state, um, unless you're, you put more energy into the system. So that's generally what's happening when things break down and it's the opposite. And as I said, unless you put more energy into the system. When we're making more elements, what we're doing is we're trying to, basically we take small pieces and we smash them together using a particle accelerator. Um, like the one they have in CERN in Switzerland or there's one in um, outside of Stanford. Um, that is a, I think that one's still the world's largest linear particle accelerator. The one in CERN is circular. Um, but basically, if you take small pieces and you smash them together, depending on what pieces you start with and how hard you hit them together, you can get them fused into new elements as well. Now, not always predictably and not always in a way that makes something stable. So a lot of times these new elements immediately break up because we made something that doesn't have the right balance of strong and weak force in the nucleus. And so they automatically just break apart. Um, and so that... But it's really the same forces that we see coming coming here. And this is a pretty pretty good article. It explains things pretty well. Um, if you're interested in that, um, so it's not that we're creating elements that are we're not violating conservation of mass when we make new elements. We're starting from smaller pieces and ramming them together so hard that form one new nucleus. Um, you know, if you you can picture taking, I don't know, two cars and smashing them together hard enough that they become a mangled hunk of metal that you can't separate one from the other. They're not really attached all that securely, but and so you could pull it apart again. That might be a, a good way of kind of understanding what these particle accelerators are doing, um, as well as they're also breaking down even protons and neutrons into the different types of quarks to provide evidence for that standard model for the different types of quarks and different types of matter that we see. Um, and then if we were to synthesize an element, 119, where would it go on the periodic table? Any guesses? If we were able to synthesize element 119, so 118 is down here, where would it, where would 119 go? Johnny? Section one. Yeah, go back into the X block. We'd start the eighth row of the periodic table by doing that. So just because we've filled in everything up to the end of the seventh row doesn't mean we're done. There's a lot of predict, you know, a lot of uh, physicists have looked at those different forces in the standard model and been able to say, okay, well, there actually is, there are some stable combinations, relatively stable combinations of protons and neutrons up in the realm of, of having an atomic number of in the 120s. So, and those actually are predicted to have a long enough half life. We could actually like, build them. If we could produce them at large scale, we would be able to actually build with them. They have some really interesting properties, um, like being really, really dense and extremely good conductors of electricity um, and extremely, um, and they should be long enough last, lasted. So, that, so they would technically still be radioactive, but they would have half lives in theory in the years to years to hundreds of years range, um, maybe even more if we get the right mixture of protons and neutrons. So we're not done. Those part, they didn't just, once they finished with 118, it's not like that, you know, okay, back it up part of the business, we're done here. Everybody go home, we just built CERN for billions and billions of dollars, but we don't need it anymore. Uh, no, there's, there's still more to figure out and more to understand. Uh, and even the, the the elements that don't seem all that useful, like francium, has an exceptionally short half life measured in the milliseconds, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so we can't actually use it to build anything because it breaks down too fast. But it's still really helpful in understanding those that standard model and how the different quarks versus gluons and bosons all interact together. Um, so it's it's really important, even though it doesn't have any practical engineering applications at this point. And I'm only through the K's 
when it comes to grading quizzes from this last week. So if you asked a question kind of related to that and I didn't answer it, it's probably because I haven't seen it yet. Um, but I feel like about half the questions this week were about synthetic elements and, and nuclear reactions. So I thought it was worth spending some time on. Um, in addition to creating new elements, uh, somebody asked a question about creating a living organism with just raw elements. So kind of going the other direction, instead of smashing really small things together, can we take the elements we already have and make something? Um, and that's actually an ongoing field of research um, in an area called, called abiogenesis. Abio biogenesis means um, life from other life. So that's like normal procreation, and speciation, and things like that. Abiogenesis is life from things that aren't living. And so it's really a study of the early Earth and how, um, how different molecules may have interacted in, in those conditions to create life. And so um, this, and I just linked the Wikipedia page because it is really, really interesting to read about um, because a lot of the various steps in here, so basically you had to start with something that has the right conditions for life to exist or for these molecules to get formed. And so they call what's called prebiotic synthesis, basically a bunch of just random carbon molecules reacting with other carbon and nitrogen and water and things around to make what what we now consider to be the building blocks of life, things like amino acids or fatty acid chains. Um, and, but those can all be made just by putting together the pieces of a habitable world and just letting them react. So we've shown that this can happen and we've shown that prebiotic synthesis can turn into larger, larger scale structures. If you take a bunch of fatty acids and you just put them together in a, you know, aqueous environment, they naturally form these sort of shapes, these, these spheres, where the outside of the sphere has properties that interact with the water, the inside doesn't, and it's sort of protected from the outside. So we can demonstrate that this happens, and then we can demonstrate that if you get those large enough, they, and they kind of shield the inside of the, of the um, um, it's called a vesicle, but basically like a bubble of fat. Um, if the inside is shielded from the outside, then you could wind up with things like RNA molecules naturally reproducing themselves without any outside interference. And we can show that happens as well. With the right RNA basis and under the right conditions for long enough, they start replicating themselves naturally. And so we've, we've shown that pretty much all of these steps individually happen. Nobody's been ever, ever, able to ever put them all together to go straight from raw components that would have been present at the, when the Earth first formed all the way to a living organism. But we demonstrate pretty much all of the individual pieces along the way. And so are sort of a proof of concept. So like I said, it's a really, really um, big field right now because it also allows us to think, to think about things like, okay, well, what other planets might there be? What conditions are really necessary in order to, to have some of these steps happen. That allows us to speculate, well, could there be life on Titan or Europa? Could there be life on you know this planet around um, Alpha Centauri or something like that? Um, it allows us to get into what's called um, xenobiology or astrobiology, basically speculating what conditions might be necessary for life to evolve on its own. Because at this point, we only have sample size one. We only know so for a fact that this process has happened once, and so the best we can do is apply it to our conditions and sort of try to understand how that all fits together. Uh, it is a really cool field, though. And then one that's not as cool, although the, the science is kind of still interesting, the sociology and psychology. Um, why is flat earth theory a thing? Didn't we, you know, sort of settle the whole like, the earth is round thing a couple thousand years ago? Yes. Um, and there is sort of, I don't know if you could call it a scientific or logical explanation, but there's a psychological explanation to why it's sort of flat earth theory is now something people are actually talking about again. Um, and it, it comes down to basically people's ways of understanding how the world works. And some people 
have a predisposition to um, really disliking the idea that the world is a random place and that the injustice and pain you see around them is a random place. And if people have that predisposition, they're more likely to believe in ideas like there's a shadow government that's running everything. Secret lizard, lizard people are in charge of the world, or the Illuminati is controlling, you know, Wall Street. Um, and while there might be certain elements of some of those conspiracy theories that actually do track with reality, in some not the lizard people so much. Um, but um, one of the things that they that that causes people to be more likely to believe in is well, all the science from like 1900 forward is or from before 1900, it's just made up and we're being fed these stories to kind of keep us in line um, so that we think we understand what's going on, but really there's a shadow government behind everything that's in control feeding us these lies, hence all the wake up sheeple sort of comments that surround flat earth theory. Um, and for it's and it really is is more of a psychological denial of, of things than it is really something you can change so there's not evidence. Sometimes flat earthers are, can actually be persuaded by evidence, but most often, than, most often conspiracy theorists, um, if you provide enough evidence or a way for them to measure the evidence they're on, they add another layer to the conspiracy. Like if you tell, take a flat earther up in an airplane and say, well, look out the window, you can see the curvature of the earth, it becomes, well, that's because they put in um, you know, lens windows in the airplane. This, these are real like objections that people have when we try to give them real explanations for this. Um, like, well, that's just because every airplane in existence has these curved windows that make it look like the Earth is curved, so that nobody uh, really understands that it's totally flat. And so you can't really, you can't logic someone out of a position that they didn't use logic to get into. The best way I've heard it explained. At some level, it's not something that you can really provide evidence and let people um, come to their own conclusions. It becomes more of a psychological issue, um, and and that it has to be addressed at that level rather than just can't you use your own eyes to see that? They will find a way to use their concrete logic to not believe the evidence that's right in front of them, which is depressing a little bit. So let's go one that's. We can explain a little bit more. Um, this is why I get into chemistry rather than psychology, right? Psychology is just way too messy. There's just too many variables. Um, why are the elements in the D and the F block so messy when it comes to electrons and periodic trends and configure electron configurations? Is there any way to use the rules or to understand the rules to explain all of it? The answer is yes, but we have to start getting more and more complicated, more and more into things um, like that standard model where we start incorporating more of those forces into it. Um, when you start getting heavy enough nuclei, they're actually like a, a gold nucleus is actually dense enough um, and heavy enough that it actually causes the electrons around it um, to travel at relativistic speeds, meaning close to the speed of light because they're orbiting it so fast. They're so attracted to that, that point in the middle that has all that mass that they actually are traveling at speeds like 90% you know, of the speed of light, which means relativity gets involved. And so when we start trying to really drill down on some of these larger elements, we start running into issues like that. We get to can explain it, but that's not what this level of understanding is for. Right now, I want everybody understanding the basic rules and that there are these exceptions out there and actually being able to run the calculations to be able to predict that yourself is something that if you go into physics or chemistry, um, you could spend your whole career explaining and adding more depth of knowledge in those areas. Um, you know, I mentioned before that I did computational chemistry. I have worked on light elements. I've made, mostly did carbon-based organic computational chemistry, the people in my group that worked on heavy metals actually had to use different computational methods that took relativity into account. So somebody had to have seen that disconnect, programmed that, and then sort of made it, made sure that it was actually accurately modeling reality. That was probably somebody's life for 10 years, working on that program that only 50 people in the world are ever going to actually use again. 
but it might wind up being really important for one of those 50 people who winds up going on to win a Nobel Prize. Right? It's hard to say exactly where the science will take it. Um, but it is it is a really good question. Um, and that my answer is we'll teach you that when you need it. For now, um, leave it alone, more or less. You can talk about it conceptually, but let's not get into the numbers too much. And then I found a chemistry meme. Remember, we talked about the double slit experiment and how we measured which slit it goes through. It didn't behave like a wave anymore. Electrons are like toddlers. They don't, they're not trained monkeys. They won't perform on commands. Um, I just thought that was, that makes me laugh every time. Partly because the little claymation thing was a great one. All right. So we ended talking about how to name ionic compounds. Ionic compounds are anytime you've got a compound where you've got a positive ion and a negative ion. So let's practice naming these compounds. Remember the general gist of it was name the positive ion, name the negative ion. Sometimes that positive ion needs Roman numerals to say what the charge on it is. So once everybody writes down these four examples, I'll switch you back to the periodic table so you can look at their charges. Yeah, we'll do that. So for this first one, what's the charge on the barium? Two plus. Two plus, and how do we know that? You're right, but how do we know that? It's in group two, second column. It's in the second column, that means it's got two valence electrons that it can lose to become stable. So when it's neutral, that's what we call its metallic state. And when it's neutral, it has the same number of protons as electrons. Nothing's changed. When it's got a, when it becomes more stable to become an ion, it's going to lose those two valence electrons from the success and be left with a plus two charge. So we're going to have barium with a plus two charge. What's the charge on the sulfur? Two minus. Two minus for the exact opposite reason, right? It needs to gain two electrons to become more stable. Remember that that distinction between the metals and the non-metals basically is the biggest definition is that the metals will gain, will lose electrons to become more stable. And non-metals tend to gain electrons to become more stable. So anything left of that stair step line on your periodic table, though the one that goes between boron and aluminum, anything to the left of that is going to be a metal and it's going to be positively charged when it's stable. Anything to the right, it's going to be negatively charged when it's stable. So we've got a plus two charge on the barium, a minus two charge on the sulfur. Do we need to specify the charge on barium? Or is there always going to be a plus two as an ion? Always plus two. So the name of the barium ion is just barium. If it was by itself, we would say barium ion. But since it's paired up with sulfur, which is a, it's a, we don't call it a sulfur ion, we call it a sulfide ion. Anytime you take a non-metal, you just give it a bunch of electrons so it fills up the, its valence shell, just drop the ending and add pi. So barium sulfide. <laughs> 
easy as that. The only place it gets trickier is if that metal ion can have more than one possible charge. And then we'll add polyatomic ions after the test next week. So how about iron and chlorine? Do we know what the charge is on the iron? There's more than one possibility, right? We can figure it out though, because we can look at what? We know that chlorine, when it's chloride, is gonna have a negative one charge. Chlorine just needs to gain one. I need to let the noble gases off so I could zoom in more. Um, it needs to gain one electron to become more stable. So we know that chloride is a negative one charge and there's three of them. So the charge on iron must be three. plus three. And since iron has more than one possible charge, we need to specify which ion it is. So we say the iron three chloride. All right, other than the first two columns, the first two columns always have predictable charges, leaving off hydrogen, but we'll get to that later. And this little chunk in the middle, other than those first two columns in these six right here, use the Roman numerals for every metal ion. Right, there's a couple others, especially in the F block, that only really have one stable oxidation state, but they're not worth memorizing. They're so rare. So for the most part, unless it's one of these six, or it's in the first two columns, use the Roman numerals for the charge. Yeah, Kat? Is that stable oxidation state? So oxidation state is another way of saying charge on an ion. Um, we'll talk about more specifically about what that means later today um, and when we talk about redox reactions, but it's basically for metals, it means the same as the charge. So what about lead and iodine? Does lead have more than one possible charge? Yeah, yeah we know it's going to be lead and we know it's going to be Iodide, but lead is not one of our six that we know. It's weird because it's not in the D block, which means depending on what definition you, you use, it's not considered a transition metal. It's called a post transition metal, um, which now it's starting to sound, sound more like a, a you know a subgenre of, of heavy metal music. Um, actually, not a bad post transition metal. I, I would listen to that. Um, <laughs> but it's still a metal and it's still not one of our six. So we still treat it like it has more than one possible charge. And in fact, it does. Lead can be plus two or plus four. So in this case, every iodide is what? Minus one. So lead must be plus four. So this is lead four iodide. If it was PBI2, then that would be lead to iodine. Different compound, different ratio of iodine to lead. And just to make the point, since I handed back all of the um, quizzes, lead iodide is a really good example of why you have to be careful with your capitalization. Right? Because if you wrote it as Like that's still PBI, right? But now that's a phosphorus and bismuth as opposed to lead and iodide, right? So it's this is a really a good example of where you could you should go wrong if you don't keep track of those those uh, capitalizations. That's actually most of you did very well on that. Um, you heated my warnings. Heated, head, heated must be heated. Um. So I'm just continuing to make the points that you should keep watching for that. And how about this last one? We have strontium and we've got bromine. What, uh, there's two 
a plus two charge on the strontium and a minus one on each bromine, does strontium have more than one possible charge? No. Now it's in that second column, right? It has two valence electrons, no, no d orbital involved at all. So it behaves just like um, there's no d orbital at all. So strontium needs to lose two electrons to become more stable. So it's always a plus two charge when it's an ion. So just name it, just be strontium bromide. What you'll see when it comes to nomenclature for this class, especially, is the trick is not the rules. The rules for nomenclature are really easy. It's knowing when you have to do which version of the rules. And when do you need to include the, the um, Roman numerals in the parentheses, and when don't you? Technically, you wouldn't be, I guess I can't say that. It would be wrong to say strontium 2 bromide, mostly because it's really redundant. Anybody who's taken as much chemistry as you can look at this and say, well, strontium is in the second row, it's always plus two. So there's really no need to specify strontium 2 bromide. When in doubt, it's better to have the Roman numerals and not need them than the other way around though, right? If I say lead chloride, you don't know if it's lead 2 chloride or lead 4 chloride. So it's when in doubt, include the Roman numerals, but for the most part, first two columns don't need it. These six don't need it. And do we remember the rules for what charge each of these has? They all only have one stable one, right? And they do follow our column organization. So we can actually work it. If you don't have it memorized, you can still work it out because you can look at aluminum and say, well, aluminum doesn't have a D orbital, nothing weird. Aluminum is normal. It needs to lose three electrons. So it could be a plus three charge and then extend that down to the ones below it. All three of them could be a plus three charge. Zinc and cadmium both have a full D orbital and two valence electrons that they can lose. So cadmium and zinc, when they're charged, are both plus two. And silver is the irregular one because it can put one electron into its d orbital and make it a full d orbital. Um, so it basically stole that one electron from the 5s. So it only has one valence electron, even though we'd expect it to have two. If it has one valence electron, then it can become a plus one. Right? But they do fit in nice neat pattern. Lots of ways you can memorize it. The main thing is remembering that that group is there. Right, and then from that you can work out plus one, plus two, plus three. So to flip that on its head, if I said um, gallium oxide, what would the formula be? For gallium oxide. Three plus. So gallium is going to be the three plus. What's the charge on oxide? Okay. Oxide is minus two. So we need two of these and three of those to make it add up to zero. So gallium two, sorry, Ga2O3 is the formula for gallium oxide. All right, so we've hammered this home enough, I think that most most of you should be feeling pretty comfortable with this. And so now we're going to do what we do anytime in this class when you get comfortable with something. We're going to make it more complicated by adding, in this case, oh, that's where it is. All right. So this is the flowchart version of specifically of ionic compounds. And we're not really gonna add anything to this other than we're gonna add more different ions when we add polyatomic ions, which means that sometimes it's not always gonna end in the nitrate. The polyatomic ion, that's where you get nitrates instead of nitriles. There's a difference there. You really both have that NIT um, root 
So well, we're not doing that for now. So at this point, everything that's gonna be on the midterm is gonna end in I. So what happens when we, so ionic compounds are what we get when we form or when we um, put something with a positive charge next to something with a negative charge. So the next possibility is, okay, well, what if we put something that there are two things that both want to have a negative charge next to each other. They're, they won't form an ionic compound because you actually make them both negative. One, those electrons would have to come from somewhere, right? You can't just be handing out electrons to every element that would be more stable with them. We are, we're bound by a law of conservation of mass. So with that in mind, if you put non-metals together, instead of trading off who has the electrons and forming ions, both of them being the electrons, by making what are called covalent bonds, right? You don't need to gain electrons, you share electrons. I'm not sure if this is, I haven't seen this beam in a long time. So this is probably not a, a, a I don't know, hip meme, it means hip, I don't know. Um, but the point remains, you don't need to gain electrons if you can share electrons. And that's what non-metals do. All right, so the way we know if something has covalent bonds, covalent literally means valent, meaning valences. Co meaning in more than one or in both at the same time. So covalent bond means you've got electrons that are in two different orbitals at the same time, which, you, which we get by just physically overlapping those orbital shapes on top of each other so that they overlap so that if an electron is right here it's close to this electron and that or sorry this nucleus and that nucleus simultaneously right and so we get this anytime you've got non-metals next to other non-metals because they both want to gain electrons and so a way we can tell if something has ionic versus covalent bonds excuse me is if it's got ionic bonds, that means you should be able to look at it and identify it. that's something with a positive charge, that's something with a negative charge. Most common way, it means the metal and a non-metal. Anytime you don't have a metal present or you don't have anything that you could look at and say that has a positive charge, you're going to have covalent bonds. Or it's, I mean, it's going to be considered a molecular compound or a covalent compound. Um, kind of use the same terminology or use mean the same thing. So of these, which one has ionic bonds? A. So A has got lots of stuff involved. So worth looking at, but none of them are metal ions, right? Or none of them are metals, which means if you can't have metals, you don't have a positive charge. Without a positive charge, no ionic bonds. So this, this example also doesn't have a metal, so it's not that one. Here we've got platinum, which is a metal, and oxygen, which is not. That means, there we go. This one is ionic. None of the others have a metal ion in there. So they're all going to be covalent bonds. And to be most accurate with the language, we'd say that they have covalent bonds, which makes them a molecular compound. Um, but the term you can say something is a covalent compound as well. Um, so don't be don't be tripped up. You see molecular, just think covalent bonds, um, because it means that when we have this in. A, Part of what this is, is showing us is that if we have this in its solid form, if we had sodium chloride in its solid form, we had those alternating ions, right? And we were just really looking for the lowest possible or um, whole number ratio because they were just going to alternate pretty much infinitely in all three dimensions to make those, those crystal structures. Remember that figure with the green and purple? spheres all stacked on top of each other. 
Covalent compounds don't do that. They're called molecular compounds because if you put them in their solid form, they stay as discrete objects. So water is a good example. When you freeze water, you still have a whole bunch of individual water molecules. They're sort of locked into a structure um, similar to this, but they're still each their own molecule. If you, which is when one of the, the things we'll talk about is why different types of compounds have different um, melting points. You would have to put in a whole bunch of energy to break this up, to allow some of these um, chlorides to move around because they're being held in place really, really tightly by the positive charges, right? So salt, solid salt has a really, really high melting point. You have to get it up in the, like, I want to say it's like 3000 Fahrenheit range. You get past most metals. You can melt salt and it looks really, really cool when you do. Um, it actually turns to purple. You, something about the fact that you've broken up these ionic bonds creates new energy levels that interact with photons so that it appears purple to the eye. Um, but you have to get it way hot. Versus water doesn't take you very much to melt it at all, right? So those the type of bonds that hold everything together will dictate some of these properties, which is why we have two different naming systems and two different ways of understanding what's going on. Right, and so uh, this is some, some terminology that I wanted to talk about for a second. Um, the molecular formula, this is, this is where we get away from ionic compounds a little bit. Ionic compounds didn't matter how much we had. We were just looking at the lowest whole number ratio that gave us a charge of zero, right? But if we don't have anything that actually has charges in molecular compounds. So it's not about making them add up to a charge of zero. It's more about how many of these pieces are stuck together in order to make sure everything has a full valence. And so that means that sometimes the actual size of the molecules is different than the lowest whole number ratio of the atoms. So the empirical formula is what we're used to thinking about for ionic compounds, lowest whole number ratio of say hydrogen to oxygen. So in this case, this is a molecule called hydrogen peroxide. It's got two oxygens and two hydrogens make up one distinct molecule. The empirical formula is the lowest whole number ratio of oxygens to hydrogen. So what would the empirical formula be? What's the ratio of oxygens to hydrogens? One to one. One to one. So the empirical formula would just be HO. But that doesn't tell us the whole story with covalent compounds because really we have this, this object that has a set number of oxygens and hydrogens. The ratio might be one to one, but the molecule has two of each. And so the molecular formula here would be H2O2. Right, so part of what this means, and I'll, I'll go over this again in some more examples here in a minute, Part of what this means, though, is that you can't just look at where something is on the periodic table and tell what the formula is going to be, like we could with ionic compounds. With ionic compounds, as long as you know the charges, you know what the lowest whole number ratio is, right? But now we can say that, well, we can have multiple possible ways. Can arrange these, and it's not show up where the covalent compounds because you need to specify how many of these you have, not just what the ratio is. So uh, let's go to example here. Um, Here's a covalent compound that's really common in organic chemistry and the real world. Um, it's 
a really good solvent um, and paint thinner, but it's also uh, very carcinogenic and bad for the environment. So it's outlawed in most most states. Um, you can't find this molecule as a solvent or at a hardware store anymore. Um, this is a molecule called benzene. So don't worry too much about why there's double bonds here and there. The main thing is looking at the number of carbons and number of hydrogens. What do we get? Of each. How many carbons? Six. Six. And how many hydrogens? Six. So the molecular formula here, it'd be C6H6. And I should specify, I. I mentioned that I did all my research in organic chemistry. Um, organic chemists write things in a different order than the, what I'm going to teach you now. So I slipped up. Um, according to what I'm going to teach you now, you always start from the left hand side of the periodic table and move towards the right. You move, put the most electronegative elements at the last ones that you write. So we would actually call this H6, C6 at this point. And organic chemists only cares about carbon, so they put the carbons first. We're going to go with another molecule that's present in everyday life. Uh, it gets used for uh, welding. Has anybody done any welding in here? A little bit. Um, what is welding gas? You just go and you just try and uh, like the most basic form of welding you can you can do. You know what you use? Okay, the arc welder uses electricity, so that, that, that's not what we're looking. I'm looking for here. Combustion. It's a combustion reaction, and it's combustion of this molecule, which is known as acetylene. So what I was looking for is just an acetylene torch, is what is one of the things you use to cut metal apart. One of the first things you learn how to weld with, um, or at least cut stuff apart with. What's the molecular formula for acetylene? Two hydrogens, two carbons. So for acetylene, what's the lowest whole number ratio? What's the empirical formula for acetylene? Just HC, right? And what's the empirical formula for benzene? Also HC. Right, so the empirical formula is really helpful in ionic compounds because we know that they actually are present in that ratio and they're not connected in these larger shapes, these larger structures. But when we get to covalent compounds, you know, historically, one of the first things that somebody would do if they had a, a you know, um, carbon-based compound, they didn't know what it was, and you were trying to figure that out, you would figure out the empirical formula first, basically just by burning it and collecting all the gas. And you could tell the ratio of carbons to hydrogens by how many how many molecules, how many moles of CO2 you made and how many moles of hydrogen you made their water. Um, and so you would get it in this empirical formula. And that's what it's, why it's called the empirical formula. Does anybody know what empirical means? Empire. Empire. It's a good, a good uh, stab at it. Um, no, it's sorry. I actually don't know what the connection is in terms of entomology between empirical and empire. Um, and now you've got me thinking. Um, but basically, empirical just means measured. It means in a lab, you're able to measure something. So in the empirical formula was literally, okay, well, we don't know what the size of the molecule actually is, but we know that the carbon is present as, at a one-to-one -one ratio of hydrogen. So a long time before they actually knew what the structure of benzene was, all they knew is that it was that it was a one-to-one -one ratio between carbon and hydrogen. Now we have more sophisticated methods for figuring out these structures and formulas into the empirical formulas. Still gets used sometimes, still shows up on standard effects tests sometimes, but it's largely a historical footnote, sort of like the Rutherford Gold Foil experiment. We don't really use empirical formulas all that much anymore. All right, and then just to add a couple, so those are, that's two ways of writing the formula. If you ever need to show the actual shape of the molecule, we use what's called the structural formula, which just means you show how the atoms are individually connected. Because it turns out, even with the same 
we can have more than one thing with the same empirical formula. We can have more than one thing with the same uh, molecular formula that's not the same compound. Um, so, for instance, let's see what's a good example. I'll go with the, the simplest one. Um, if you have four carbons in a row and you add a bunch of hydrogen so that every carbon has the full valence, you get this structure, which is what's called butane. But if you take this and we rearrange some of the pieces, we can make another stable structure that's where the carbons are forked instead of having all of the carbons in one straight line, you wind up with this sort of branch structure. What's the molecular formula for the top one? How many carbons are, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna write it like an organic chemist, sorry. How many hydrogens? 10. And four carbons, right? What about down here? How many hydrogens? Also 10. And how many carbons? Also four. So even just the molecular formula itself is not enough on its own to tell these two molecules apart. And these two are two separate molecules. This is called methyl propane and this is called butane. And they behave differently. Butane has a, a different melting point and a different um, vaporization point than methyl propane. Right, so we'll get into with when you, if you take OCHEM or in Chem 103, you learn the basics of them, how to name these compounds. But basically, when we need to show the actual structure and what's connected to what in order to make it an unambiguous name, we use that, that structural formula that looks something like this. And so this would be a pretty simple structure. And what we're going to do after we take our break is learn how to, one, name these, and two, um, draw these structural formulas so that we can get the right structures. All right, so let's come back at five after, and we will keep going. So what's that? Yes, yeah, yeah. So it could be that sometimes those salt ions that are in the water can react with with the uh, different cells in you know a dirt or things like that. It's not necessarily that it's pulling all of that out of your skin. Mm -hmm. It's probably that the salts interacting with that. Uh, yeah. It's probably not actually sodium. You are you know it's in you put so sodium chloride or sodium that looks like bromine or iodine. Sodium iodide maybe. So we use water, we flood the ion and then put salt in the water. It's all in the water. So probably. So that that. So I mean, you're probably also smelling the, the halogens. It smell a little bit like bromine from the pool or a hot tub. Can you catch any of that? So halogens are the following second thing, like chlorine, bromine, iodine. Um, so because the sodium is not, when you say you add the salt, you also add a halogen. You probably a halogen with that sodium, and that could be what's when you apply a voltage to it. So if it's table salt, that's chlorine. Um, so that could be that you're doing some of that, or it could be, you know, it could be causing some of the proteins and stuff on your skin, on the, like, on the dead skin. 
But, so Mike, could you do this um, with just anything? Like if you took a piece of grass-fed beef or something, you and you put that in there, would it do the same thing? Or is it something specific to the people or beef or Because because it's it's yeah. Yes, it, that's not all stuff that came out of your feet. For no, sure. that's what I'm wondering. Like, so it's a question of what else is what there, is what it could be reacting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'd be I'd be yeah. curious too. Um, yeah, because I don't my own. Yeah, curious. Yeah. Um, yeah, see if you look up the, the brand of the ionizer or something like that. Yeah, send, um, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good. That actually is a really good project for the for third quarter when um, yeah. if we do your do research projects. I love like, kind of why. Yeah, because you could actually figure like we could we could look it up beforehand when we wanted to test it. Like, yeah, something happens. So, something happens, but I don't know what it is. Right. If it is what they claim, those things. Right, and, but if and then but you have if you have somebody who's you know totally vegan, straight edge, and if they put their feet in there, okay. it, it still would it give them the same thing. Probably. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, so I doubt that it's actually. But then that that's unexpected. We'll have to look into this more. That's really interesting. So the easiest way is to go back to your Excel sheet and just right click anywhere. So right, 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 right on the, the corner. There. You can also use a snipping tool too. You can use like a screenshot tool and, and put it in there that way. My question is simply less easy. Um we have a site in all of our Vaguely. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it depends. Not everybody's going to cause all of the same thing. So the standard model of Lagrangian is probably going to be the most complete form that includes every force possible. But for the most part, in chemistry, we are interested in where the electrons are. Most of us are not, or most chemists are not working on nuclear reactions. Because if, if they were, then we'd be looking at that, the complete standard model. Although we might even, we might even be able to ignore the electromagnetic force. But basically, it's just a combination of all the But so you, you can usually say, okay, well, we're going to get more gravity because the ball of force is so small. We're going to get more heat force because we're not going to be able to get more heat force. And that's a common term here. Which I don't know. Can you go down? How often is that even used? It's in its whole state almost never because we just find it like too computationally intensive and that too many variables even for supercomputers to be able to solve it. Yeah. I I appreciate the offer. That's a great, that's a great This term, and you ignore muons and taons because they only occur at a measurable amount of 
um, this term will simplify down to the, the time independent sugar. So we use typically chemistry cares more about would be interested in other terms, but they might be able to this is the total version of it, but uh, we wouldn't have to interact with It'd be overkill. Most of these terms, and any one system is As everybody's coming back in, let's do some more practice. So these are these are what are known as molecular model. These two on the right are molecular models, rather than we can call them just a a structural formula. This is kind of close to what we'd consider a structural formula. These have the same information, but show more about the three dimensional shapes of these atoms. Um, so this is this is even a step beyond just looking at the structural formulas and one that we're going to get to in the lab for this week has us making some of these three, nothing this complicated. Um, although we'll find that this is actually a pretty simple molecule um, in biochems um, standards by biochem standards. It's only uh what's it 24 atoms which in in biochem terms is almost nothing um because you wind up regularly having you know proteins that are made up of a hundred thousand atoms um so uh probably not quite that high they have a mass and molecular weight of in the hundreds of thousands of grams per mole um so this is a pretty small molecule by that standard but we haven't zoomed out far enough to see the rest of the biochem molecules yet. So what would the molecular formula be for the molecule above? So in the, in the OCHEM notation where you put the carbons first, and which I would not mark you down for any of that, but in general, the, the rule that we're gonna use here, if you're not sure, is put whatever's furthest to the left goes first in the equation, which would make this H12, C six O six more commonly written by biochemists and organic chemists is C six H twelve O six. Um, what would the empirical formula be? C. C. It wouldn't just be CHO because that would imply you have one to one ratio of all of them. H two CO. So H2CO means you have twice as many hydrogens as carbons, and you have the same number of carbons and oxygens. Would you write it as CH2O or? Um, I wouldn't even use a, a empirical formula normally for this molecule because CH, CH2O is actually is a molecular formula for a more common for a more a pretty common molecule called formaldehyde. Um, this molecule is not from aldehyde. Does anybody recognize that formula? They can say what it is. Glucose. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, it's also the molecular formula for fructose. Glucose and fructose have the exact same molecular formula. The only difference is that with fructose, this carbon oxygen double bond is on the second carbon instead of being on the first carbon. Right, so they really are very similar chemically and they're very similar, they're identical in terms of their molecular formula, which is half the reason why we have to use either names or um, structural formulas to tell the difference between them. All right, so when we're naming these things, we're not gonna just, so classically the way that these, these these covalent compounds were named um, was mostly based on either where they showed up in nature or 
um, you know, they would have a common name based on, on you know, where they're found naturally. So for instance, um, formic acid and formaldehyde are actually both present in fairly high amounts in, um, in ants, in the inside of an ant in most insects. They don't have a circulatory system. Their blood is made up of mostly a formic acid and um, with small amounts of formaldehyde. So formaldehyde and formic acid, formic actually means from ants in Latin, maybe Greek. Um, I think formica is actually the Latin name for, for ants. Um, so they actually have that weird relationship and things like, um, you know, there's a molecular compound called morphine. It's not named based on how many carbons or hydrogens or oxygens. It has its name for the Greek god of sleep because it put people to sleep when they tested it on people. Um, so you wind up with all these weird common names that aren't actually tied to how many of the each atom you have. But for the most part for this class, until we get into organic chemistry and biochemistry, we're going to name these covalent compounds just based on how many of each element they have. And we do that by using these prefixes. And so again, these are the same prefixes that you've usually seen them in other places by now. And when, you, when I test you on nomenclature for ionic compounds, I, I saw at least half a dozen people do this just practicing for the midterm where they try to use these prefixes for all the ionic compounds on page two or three or whatever it is on the practice test. And everybody instinctively tries to use these prefixes to say how many of something you have. Only for covalent compounds. We're never going to use these prefixes for ionic compounds. And they, for the most part, a lot of you have probably seen these before, but if not, you definitely have seen words that use a lot of these prefixes. Um, so mono means one, di means two, tri means three. In everyday use, I always thought the next one should be quad, um, but it's actually tetra, which is the Greek number for four rather than quad is Latin based. Um, these are all Greek based rather than Latin based. Some of them overlap though. Um, penta means five, hexa means six, hepta means seven, octa means eight, nona means nine, deca means 10. There's ways you can take it past that, but that's as far as we're gonna go for now. Um, we're not gonna deal with anything that has we're not going to use this nomenclature system for anything that has more than 10 in a certain atom. Um, and the way we name these is you just stick that prefix in front of the name of the first element, which is the one furthest to the left, or the one that's less electronegative. And then you, you do a prefix and then the second one. And whatever the most electronegative element is, you drop the ending and you put I. So just like with sodium chloride or, or magnesium sulfide, we drop for those negative, for those non-metals, we drop the ending and put I. We do the same thing for whatever is the most electronegative element, which means closest to fluorine. Fewest steps to fluorine is usually the best way to think about that. So if we have, and again, this is only for molecular compounds or for covalent compounds. If you only have non-metals, we, we use this system. If you have a metal and a non-metal, we go back to the other system to say the name of each ion. So for instance, if we had N2O4, was the name of that compound. Dinitrogen tetraoxide. Um, it's one thing I usually mention. That's the one that always stuck out to me. It's like the rest of these I've seen in other places for the most part. Um, Nona is a little bit weird, but it looks a lot like nine, so it's not hard to figure out. Um, tetra is the same root that gives the game Tetris its name. Tetris comes from the Greek word tetra, meaning four. Every block, every piece that you can get in Tetris is made up of four squares arranged in different ways, right? That's a, and then clearing four lines at the same time when you finally get the long skinny piece, 
I was, was always told that's called getting a Tetris. Um, that's what helped me remember that Tetra was for, because I always went back to Tetris, probably because I spent more time on my TI-83 playing Tetris than um, listening in some of my classes when I was in high school. Did, did people still do that with your TI? Like, it's easier on your phone now than but four cell phones were a thing. You had we had, there was all sorts of different games. You had to play Bomberman, um, where you could connect to somebody else's TI eighty three. You could play Doc. Yeah, it was, we've got real creative with finding ways to play video games instead of pay attention. Um, anyway, you always you had to find somebody who had the cable that went to the USB for the computer so that you could get it on the first time and then they just needed a quarter inch coax cable to put it on other people's so you had to find that one person at it first and then you everybody could get it um but you can't go to the app store on ti 83 anyway all right so uh let's do another practice with these <laughs> Same empirical formula. And if you just Google this, you're going to get the wrong answer. And I'll tell you why in a second. What is the name using this system for, for NO2? So nitrogen and oxygen. So it's going to be something nitrogen and something oxide. There's two oxygens, so it's going to be dioxide. And the reason I use this as an example is because this is the one time where it gets a slightly more complicated is you don't use the prefix on the first element if it's one. If there's only one of the first element, you don't say mononitrogen dioxide, it's just nitrogen dioxide. If it's not specified, you're supposed to assume that it's one. But for these second ones, there's so many possibilities. They're all close to the same amount of um, oxygens relative to nitrogens. We always specify for the second one. So NO would be nitrogen monoxide. We say mono for the second element, but not the first. Um, which also allows means you can do, yeah, there's lots of, of uh, chemistry memes of like, Playing with Google's auto response, so you can say like, Google, what's the what's the formula for um, nitrogen monoxide, or do you know the formula for nitrogen monoxide? Google just says no, because that is the formula for nitrogen monoxide. Um, and when you get into polyatomic ions, you can get even more creative. Google, what's the formula for um, sodium hypobromide? And you get not bro. So childish or, you know, it's again, things you figure out when you're sitting with Google and not a whole lot to do and you study chemistry. All right. So I guess I shouldn't say that's the only time we don't follow this rule. The other time we don't follow this basic um, formula is if it's in its elemental state. If you put a whole bunch of non-metals together, and they form these covalent bonds because that's how you can fill all the different valences at the same time with a fixed number of electrons. Well, what happens if you take the same nonmetal, if you put chlorine in its most pure state? What's the uh, electron configuration look like on chlorine when it's on its own? Well, chlorine is in the third row, right? So it's going to be 1s2, 2s2. 2p6, 3s2, 3p5, right? It needs to gain one electron to be stable. We drew out that last orbital, the 3p orbital. It has that one little gap that keeps it from being a full orbital that makes it unstable. So if you put a bunch of these elements together, a bunch of these atoms together that all need to gain one electron to become way more stable or share a pair of electrons, they're going to do that. And so you don't actually you have what's called elemental chlorine. You don't actually have chlorine atoms. You have chlorine molecules. Chlorine is naturally 
found when in its pure state, boring is present as Cl2. But we don't name that dichloride or dichlorine even. We just call that chlorine gas. In its most, if it's a non-metal that can become more stable just by sharing some electrons with, with another atom of the same type, then when it's in its pure state, you actually have a molecular compound or a molecular element to be more precise with the wording, right? It's not a compound, it's all chlorine and it's neutral because a compound means you have to have more than two elements there. So you get, you get molecular elements for all of these that are in, that are colored in, in yellow are all naturally found their most stable state under Earth-like conditions um, is as diatomic molecules. Right, and so diatomic molecules just means that when you have pure nitrogen, you don't have nitrogen atoms, you have N2. When you have pure oxygen, you don't have oxygen atoms, you have O2. Right, this is the root for why that is the case. You probably have seen O2 or N2 written in you know, a biology class or something like that. The reason that pure oxygen is present as O2 is because it needs to share electrons to build those valences. Um, and frankly, all nonmetals do this, but a lot of them don't necessarily have like, predictable structures that they form. Um, so these three that are in the pink here um, exist as polyatomic molecules, but I'm not going to have you memorize what they are because they vary a little bit. For instance, um, if you've heard of three different types of phosphorus. You can have elemental phosphorus can be white phosphorus, red phosphorus, or black phosphorus. And there's even another form called violet phosphorus. They're all pure phosphorus. They're all phosphorus in its elemental state, but they all have different number of phosphoruses in these uh, molecular structures. And sulfur does the same thing. Sulfur can be present in this one. I can actually draw one of them, at least I can draw. Sulfur can be present as S4 or S10 or 12, I think 10. Um, when it's present as S4, you actually get these, the sort of three-sided pyramid. That looks like, if you can imagine a triangle with one sulfur pointed straight into the board. So basically a three-sided pyramid. Sulfur is naturally present like this, but it also, if you change the pressure and the temperature, you can get it to be present as a solid in this 10-sided three-dimensional ring that looks a little bit like a soccer ball. Right? So for those ones, and we're not gonna get, I'm not gonna get too specific um, on what I, in terms of what I'm asking you to remember, but all the ones in yellow, I want you to remember that those are present as diatomic molecules. And when I ask you a question like on the practice test, where I say, this one right here, F, Cl2, if I ask for the name, that's just chlorine or chlorine gas if you want. But even if you made it a liquid, it would still just be chlorine. You don't need a different name for it. And on the flip side, if I said, write the formula for hydrogen gas, what I'm looking for is for you to write H2, right? This is the default. And we specify if they're present as individual atoms, we say it's a hydrogen atom. But if it's present in its normal state, we just say hydrogen gas is H2. Ronnie? If it's two, can you still say back for and chlorine? No. Mm -hmm. So so what we're we're trying to get away from is that that this is the other time where we don't use that if it's in its elemental state. Um, and even we do wind up having other ways of distinguishing these. Like I said, there's the white versus black versus red phosphorus. And there's, you know, diamond versus graphite versus buckyball. They're all different forms of the elemental carbon. Um, 
So there are, are other distinctions within these, but for now, at the very least, I want you to remember it's column 17, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen are the ones where I want you to remember that. Right, and I, I won't ask you about the other non metals in there. I'm going to say, all right. So, I was, um, can you go back to the other slides? Um, you mean the practice test? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, she's the example of vanadium, mm -hmm. um, and uh, iron. Would that be, would that be vanadium? Or would that be what you just said it wouldn't be that because it's an ion? Because it's an ionic compound. Okay. This is where I, right, the individual rules are hard at knowing which set to use, right? Mm -hmm. So you're never going to use those di tri prefixes unless it's only non metals. So these if are all ions on this sheet, right? Um, they, no. They get the top of the set. I yeah. Know. It just says if a name is given, write the correct formula. It doesn't say did they're all ions. Okay. So disulfur tetraoxide, we can do that, right? And the way that I would I would use the test against so and you know I'm gonna ask about a mixture of them. There's gonna be a mixture of, of covalent and ionic. And there's going to be a mixture of where I give you the name or I give you the formula. Use the names that I give you to jog your memory. Like, oh, he's using the prefixes there. Why is he using the prefixes there, but not on tungsten six selenide? You know, use that to sort of jog your memory and remind yourself what the rules are. You can actually, if you work backwards, assuming that I don't make any mistakes when I write these, you can actually work backwards and figure out ionic versus covalent and what the prefixes are and things like that, just based on what I give you. That would slow you down a lot. So you don't want to have to do that, but definitely make use of the fact that the test itself has lots of information in it. Not as good as your own notebook, but it's not bad if you know what to look for. So for the vanadium one, vanadium is a metal, right? Which means this is an ionic compound. Which means we don't use the prefixes. We would write it as vanadium iodide. And we, then we just need to specify which vanadium it is. So there's five iodides and every iodide is a minus one charge, right? So it's five. And again, if you don't remember your, your Roman numerals, if you wrote five there, I'm okay with that. Just make sure you put it in parentheses. I have a question about uh, Yeah. So how does, um... How does it work to have that since like iodine only has one three? We're going to get into that. Okay. So when we start looking at beyond just naming them, um, here's more practice with naming. And this one specifically says ionic versus, um, actually these are all ionic, just this is just a review slide um, that I used coming back from break last year, but we're ahead of pace. Um, so I'll leave that. Here's a bunch of practice with molecular compounds, aka covalent compounds. When you know it's molecular versus ionic, it's really easy. When I mix them together, the first step needs to be which branch of the flow chart am I starting on? Am I going, is this the use the prefixes or is this just say the name of each ion? Right? That's the trick with this. But let's talk about those dot structures because this is the last real tricky concept before, before the midterm. So we saw these a little bit. We, saw, we used dots to represent electrons a little bit on last week's lab, right? Or was that the IC? I don't remember which, but what I called it. Um, but for metals, it, it's a pretty good way of uh, visualizing what the charge on a metal might be because you can look at it at say calcium and say okay well it's got two electrons it's a lot easier to take two electrons away than gain six electrons so calcium when it's stable is probably a plus two 
So it's they're kind of useful for metals, and they're kind of useful in terms of non-metals for saying, okay, well, this chlorine just needs to gain one electron. But the problem with that is, is that's that's assuming that each of them is going to follow what's called the octet rule. And the octet rule is at its most basic, um, is just the idea that that elements tend to become more stable when they have a group of eight electrons around the outside, or eight valence electrons. We've already seen that that's not necessarily the case, especially for metals, because if we looked at um, the electron configuration for zinc ion, we would get argon as our abbreviation, then uh, 3D 10 4S2, or the other way around. Once you lose that, those four uh, S2 electrons, so this would be for neutral zinc. So for zinc 2 plus, we're going to lose those four S electrons, which means the valence is now N equals three. Right, so if I wrote this out more completely, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, we don't have the 4s2 anymore, so then it would just be 3d10. So how many valence electrons do we have on zinc now, on the zinc ion? 18. 18 valence electrons. All of these. Our valence electrons because they're all in n equals three right and there's some other things that happen when the d orbital gets involved and make it so that you can actually have more than eight electrons around a non-metal as well in the valence shell because you start being able to use that d orbital that's involved and d orbitals make things behave weird right so we're going to mostly we're not going to call use the octet rule very generally Generally speaking, we want to make sure things have at least eight electrons in their valence shell, but we can go above that based on certain criteria, which is, Nancy, was it Edward, your question said, how does IF5 work when you only you know, have eight electrons? Well, it turns out because iodine has a D orbital, the D orbitals can hold more than more electrons. You can actually get more than those eight electrons around it. Anything from the third row on. Um, if it's just one atom, all you do is you draw the number of valence electrons as dots. And again, I'm never going to really ask you about this because it doesn't tell us anything the periodic table doesn't already tell us, right? We're already used to using the periodic table, so why would we bother with this? If there are two non-metal atoms, the number of vacancies predicts the number of bonds that that, el that element will, fix, will require to become more stable until we start breaking that off that rule. So it's still a general rule is you want to get at least eight electrons to fill the valence because, um, and that's accurate for everything larger than helium, right? Helium and hydrogen, because they're in N equals one, they only can have a total of two electrons. But once you get into the second energy level and beyond, we want at least eight electrons to fill up a P orbital and an S orbital for every energy level. So for Chlorine, chlorine has one vacancy to get up to eight. So chlor that predicts that chlorine in its most stable state will form um, a, a single bond that allows both of these electrons to be considered to be part of each atom's valence at the same time. They, they physically, spatially have to be in between those two nuclei for this to work. Otherwise, you can't say that they're in both orbitals at the same time. So we draw that as this line. This line represents a pair of electrons, where you've got one electron being donated from each of the atoms on each side. When it comes to counting how many electrons are in our system, that's the easy place to, to mess up, is to forget that that's actually two electrons. Because once we get to this point, we're, we're pretty much only going to be dealing with electrons in pairs. And so we, it can be useful to think about everything as pairs of electrons instead of just sheer numbers. Because unpaired electrons are really unstable. 
unless they're in a deep orbital and then there's other things going on, like the, all that exchange energy. But for non-metals, um, we want all of our electrons to be paired up. If you have an electron that's not paired up, that's actually what a free radical is. That term that's been floating around for um, in nutrition circles for you know probably a decade plus at this point, probably more than that. I'm pretty sure I heard about free radicals from pop culture when I was in in undergrad. Um, all a free radical is is it's a molecule that has an unpaired electron which is gonna go out and try and find another electron somewhere else, which can cause lots of health issues if it happens to grab a spare electron from say your DNA in a cell that's about to split. This is part of normal life. Um, if it happens to grab, to cause your DNA to mutate because this free radical grabbed an electron from your DNA, um, then that's how you wind up get, with free radicals being carcinogens. Um, because mutating DNA almost always leads to either no visible outcome or um, cancer in one form or another. That's basically what your options are. You're not getting, sorry to rain on any grades, you're not getting superpowers. Um, actually, I think that was one of the funniest. I'm not a huge family guy fan, but I love Seth MacFarlane. One of the funniest family guy jokes was I think it was the mayor Adam West who goes and rolls around in toxic waste at the, at the landfill and goes to the doctor hoping to get superpowers. It's, Mr. West, you have leukemia. And the doctor says, you rolled around in radioactive waste. What did you think was going to happen? Because that's what happens most of the time. That actually is like a reasonable doctor's response to somebody doing that. Anyway, if we're going to do a Lewis dot structure for a molecule, if it's just two atoms, it's pretty straightforward, just like this one. If it's more than two atoms, it can be a little bit tricky. So, so th these are the steps in the order that I would usually do them. And one is you want to start by determining the total number of valence electrons. Anything that's not in a valence shell, though, is so stable that it's not going to react and we're going to ignore it. So we only care about valence electrons when, when it comes to those stop structures. Then we figure out what atom belongs at the center. And that can be a little bit tricky. The most, most of the time, the easiest way to do this is whatever you have one of goes in the middle. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you have one of two different elements. So how do we decide what goes in the middle? Whatever is, is the, has, can form the most bonds, or is the least electronegative is gonna go in the middle. In this case, for water, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so we wouldn't normally expect it to be in the middle because oxygen doesn't like to share. That's what makes it electronegative. Um, but in this case, hydrogen can't be in the middle because how many vacancies does hydrogen have? One. Just one, right? Hydrogen only has one open spot and it's one S orbital. So hydrogen, no matter what, will never make more than one bond at most, right? Because you wind up with only needing one electron to fill hydrogen's valence. So in this case, hydrogen will never be at the middle because middle inherently implies that it's gonna have more than one bond. And so hydrogen always has to go at the outside um, and other than hydrogen, it's whatever is the least electronegative that's going to go in the middle. So then we, we can arrange the atoms by which, I mean, you just, whatever you decided goes in the middle, you write it in the middle and you put everything else around it for starters. And we see what that looks like. So in this case, that would look something like, well, I know there's an oxygen and a hydrogen and a hydrogen. They have to both be attached to the oxygen or it wouldn't all be one molecule, right? And we didn't total up. How many valence electrons do we have here? How many from oxygen? Zero. Valence electrons? Six. Six total, right? Because you've got the 2s2 and the 2p4. So oxygen has a total of six valence electrons and each hydrogen can bring how many? There's two hydrogens and they each bring one electron. 
So that gives us a total of eight valence electrons. I'm going to write total, but I just remember that means we're not considering four electrons. Anything in the one in um, the one s orbital for oxygen, we're ignoring. So we arrange these. We know that the oxygen has to go in the middle because hydrogen can't go in the middle. And then we just say, okay, well, I know that they have to be connected. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a molecule. If one of these hydrogens didn't have a bond to the oxygen, it wouldn't be H2O. It would be something else. So we know that those have to be there and they have to be connected. And then, so then add bonds to the center atom. And then step five is kind of like, and now draw the rest of the owl um, in one of those drawing tutorials. Um, all right, assign the remaining electrons so that everything has a full valence, which can be a little tricky sometimes. So you need to look at it and see what's up here and what still needs more electrons. And we also have to think about how many electrons we still have. We just used how many electrons to make those bonds. Total of four electrons. So how many electrons left? Four electrons left. What's, what doesn't have a full valence yet? It will, there are only two options, right? Hydrogen only needs two electrons to have a full valence. The hydrogens are good. Oxygen needs at least eight electrons. So we still have spots for two more pairs of electrons. Now, how many valence electrons does the oxygen have? Eight, and it wants eight to be stable, right? Because that gives it, a, that fits that octet rule, that fits with it all having only completely filled orbitals, even if we had to get creative with how we did it. All right. So we're going to, uh, let's, we'll stop covering new material and just talk about the test and plan for the rest of the uh, next week, um, just so we're all on the same page. Um, so we'll, we'll pick this up on Thursday. And then after we finish the rest of this lecture, the rest of Thursday is going to be time for everybody to ask questions about the practice test, more practice for doing this stuff, the most recent material. You want to review and do practice with conversions, whatever you ask me questions about, that's what we're going to do on, on Thursday. Um, we will not officially, uh, so we will meet next week for lab on Monday and Tuesday, but I'm giving you an assignment which you have a whole week and a half to work on. So you don't need to start that assignment right before you take the test. Um, so that's actually more time that you can use to review. If you have more questions, come to me on Monday or on Tuesday morning, and we can go over anything you want to talk about. Um, but do show up so I can introduce that new assignment, um, which will be a writing assignment. Have you go out and, and look stuff up on the internet and answer some questions. Um, and it's actually kind of a fun one. So, um, and then we'll take the test next Tuesday. Right? And so show up next Tuesday afternoon here, unless you made arrangements to take the Proctoring Center, show up here next Tuesday at one, just like all over lecture, you'll have a full two hours to work on it. When you're done with it, turn it in, you're good to go. All right, any, any questions about how uh, that's going to look? David? Uh, looking at the practice what's the electronic geometry? So that's what we're going to look at. Once we start drawing these little stop structures, you'll see that those bonds wind up pushing each other away and forming some of those shapes. And so we can actually use geometric shapes in 3D to look at what the shape of molecules are. And so, so the electronic geometry is the basic shape that it makes, and the molecular geometry is where the atoms even actually see. So we'll add all that in lunch or in lab tomorrow or in um, class on Thursday. Okay. And I have a question. So, you know, when we this, you want to say, so you just now any further questions or like, yeah, so basically, like, the idea that I have is a physical object, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> 